Well, hello again. Uh, we're now in week five, and uh, we just have a little bit more to cover. And then I'm going to give you a test slash quiz, which is already made up. It's uh, it's on Blackboard. By the time you watch this video, it should be available for you to take. So what you should know about that quiz is uh, it's 25 multiple choice questions. And uh, you'll have two attempts at it. They are timed attempts. You'll have 90 minutes uh, for each attempt. Um, at the end of 90 minutes, it will automatically submit. Uh, so don't just walk away from it, you know, half done. Make sure once you start it, you have enough time to finish it. Um, I'll take the highest of the two grades. So what I suggest you do is don't wait too long. It's going to be up all week um, till Friday at 5. So basically the work week, 8 a.m. Monday till 5 p.m. Friday. And uh, what I would do if I were you is um watch you know this this after you've watched this video go take the test and uh then go back and look through for the things that maybe you got wrong go back through the videos go back through the slides and then retake the test again and you should do better you know anything you got wrong the first time theoretically you'll get right the second time through so uh with that let me just cover a couple little things um let me turn this off here, and uh, let's bring up our PowerPoint uh, from before. And let's see, we were down oh, about here. So this is a slide we were working on. And if you recall, you know, we were talking about Kind of this, uh, let me change this color here. Kind of this sweet spot here in the air fuel ratio where uh, catalytic converter efficiency is close to 100%. You know, and um, what we said, or what I'm saying now, anyhow, is that th this is not necessarily the ideal air fuel ratio for everything. You know, if you want more power, you want to be more over here on the richer side. If you want better fuel economy, you want to be more over here on the leaner side. But uh, if you want the best, uh, you know, compromise for the converter to successfully get rid of NOx, HC, and CO, then this is about where you need to be. So, you know, it's a compromise. It's not the best for NOx. The best for NOx is more over here. It, HC and CO, it's more here, you know, but you're gonna give up one to get the other. So right here in the middle, it's uh, it's pretty good for all of those things. So hang on a minute, get rid of this stuff. All right. So we already talked about volumetric efficiency. And just as a quick review, you know, volumetric efficiency is a, a measurement of how well the engine is breathing. And that's affected by both the intake and the exhaust. So, uh, you know, things that can affect volumetric efficiency, of course, uh, built into the engine are, you know, engine design, intake manifold, exhaust manifold, uh, intake and exhaust ports, the valves, how big they are, how, how many there are, how far they open, how long they stay open. Um, the size of the throttle body, you know, those are all things that are kind of fixed in the engine. Uh, things that change all the time are throttle opening, so that's driver demand basically, and engine RPM, which typically follows throttle opening a little bit. So, uh, things to look into here, right, is that when the throttle is closed, right? It's limiting the airflow into the engine, so your volumetric efficiency goes way down. Um, and when you open the throttle and let more air in, then it breathes better, volumetric efficiency goes up. Also, high engine speed limits time air can flow into the cylinder. So at really high RPMs, uh, volumetric efficiency can drop off very rapidly. So. Um, as a rule, and this is not completely 100% true, but when you've got the throttle open 
and something is keeping the engine speed down, that's when you're going to have uh, the best volumetric efficiency and the highest cylinder pressure. And I talk about the cylinder pressure on purpose because uh, this is going to have an effect on our ignition system. So we're going to talk about that really soon. So the other statement here, volumetric efficiency is lowest when the engine's turning fast and the throttle's closed. Think of a situation like deceleration. You're going down the highway and you take your foot off the gas. So you're blocking off the incoming air and the engine's turning real fast. So it's appetite for air is kind of high. So you're kind of, you're throttling it. You're choking it to death. And it doesn't make any power at all when you take your foot off the gas. All righty, let me go to the next slide here. This, I, 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 uh, I think I already said this, but in case I didn't, I, this is my second time through uh, recording this. It's now Sunday night. When I went to play back the original recording, uh, I had no sound and I realized I had muted my microphone for a complete half hour discussion. And so, uh, this, this is uh, just a second attempt and unfortunately may not be quite as good because it's kind of late on Sunday night. Okay, so <clears throat> I have a couple questions here. When is the engine turning slowly with the throttle open and, and when is it turning fast with the throttle closed? And which situation would develop more power? So uh, first question, when is the engine turning slowly with the throttle open? Think of this way, you're, you're towing a big trailer up a mountain. Um, so the, the load from that trailer is holding the engine speed down. Way different than if you just put it in park or neutral and step on the accelerator, you know, the engine speed shoots right up. Uh, with a big load on the engine, of course, that's, that's fighting against that and kind of holding the engine RPM down a little bit. But at the same time, you have the throttle wide open. So with the engine turning relatively slowly, the intake valve is open for kind of a long time compared to how long it's open when the engine's going fast. So there's more time for air to flow into the cylinder. And with the throttle open, uh, there's no restriction keeping air from flowing into the cylinder. So um, under a heavy load, you're going to have uh, wide open throttle and the engine not turning slowly necessarily because you know the transmission will downshift but uh, that load is holding the speed back some. Second question, when's the engine turning fast with the throttle closed? Uh, if you drive a manual transmission you'd know this you know when you're going down the road and you downshift take your foot off the gas now the uh, the transmission's driving the engine and you have that engine braking going on and the throttle's closed, so the engine has a high demand for airflow because it's turning fast, but the throttle is blocking that air off. And so uh, your volumetric efficiency and therefore your cylinder pressure is going to be really, really low. So which situation would develop more power? Seems like a dumb question. Obviously, when I take my foot off the gas, I'm not going to develop much power. So, uh, or, or no power, or maybe even negative power. And when I'm wide open throttle, that should give me the most uh, power. So what I'm trying to get to here and how it relates to the ignition system is cylinder pressure. So cylinder pressure is related to atmospheric pressure. So it can change with atmospheric conditions. Um, it's related to manifold pressure. So that can be affected by uh, you know, throttle opening and other things. And it's affected by the length of the time the intake valve is open. So manifold pressure is highest when the throttle is open. Uh, the intake valve open time is affected by engine speed. So what's the relative pressure under these four conditions here? Um, so we don't need to talk about all of these so much, but let's just look at these two. So, you know, under a heavy load, what's going on under a heavy load? This is what I just talked about. You have the throttle open or maybe even wide open. And that load is holding the engine speed back. So now we have uh, intake valve open for a 
a pretty long amount of time, relatively speaking, and very little restriction to the intake airflow. So, you know, under a heavy load, what do we got? We've got uh, wide open throttle probably, plus, um, you know, limited en engine RPM. We're gonna have very high cylinder pressures. Now, if we change to the absolute opposite of that, right? The opposite is D cell. So D cell, what do we have? We have uh, closed throttle. And we have uh, possibly high RPM. That's going to give us low cylinder pressure. I don't know why I'm randomly choosing to capitalize and not capitalize. Uh, so we, we look at those two extremes, right? Idle and crank. Uh, you know, idle, you've got the throttle closed, uh, but the engine's turning relatively slowly. But that closed throttle is the biggest thing here that's going to kind of eliminate, um, you know, much pressure in the cylinders. And under cranking, kind of the same thing. It might actually be a little higher under crank because, uh, you know, crank, the engine RPM is really uh, low, right? But still, the throttle is closed. So the ones that we really kind of care about, uh, heavy load and diesel. So having, you know, listened to all that, let's talk about what happens inside the uh, cylinder when the spark plug fires. So you have resistance across the spark plug gap. Resistance, you know, you know, from electricity is, uh, you know, opposes current flow. We're trying to get current to flow across the gap. What affects spark plug gap resistance? The width of the gap is huge. You know, if you have a, a wider gap, it's going to take more voltage to jump it. If your gap is smaller, it's going to take less voltage to jump it. But driving down the road, <clears throat> your spark plug gap's not changing. What is changing? Two things are changing inside that cylinder. One is the air fuel ratio, and the other is the uh, pressure in the cylinder. So we've already talked about pressure in the cylinder. We know when that's you know high. And now I want to talk a little bit about air fuel ratio. So let me bring this up again. Lean mixtures have higher resistance than rich mixtures. So when uh, when cars used to have carburetors, there was something called an accelerator pump. And uh, so you would step on the accelerator and that would open the throttle, which lets more air in, of course, right? So now you have this going on. You open the throttle, you have more pressure in the cylinder. That gives you higher resistance. Whoops higher resistance at the spark plug. If you leave it lean, now the combination of that high pressure and lean air fuel mixture is gonna create uh, the need for really high voltage in order to jump that spark plug gap. If we throw a little extra fuel at it and rich in the mixture, right, that's going to help fix this problem here. Uh, and reduce the resistance across that spark plug gap. So what are the worst conditions for creating a spark? Think about it. If you have both, well, both high pressure, so what causes that? You know, wide open throttle, heavy load, and lean air fuel mixtures, that's gonna be the worst condition for creating a spark. It's going to require the most energy out of the ignition coil. Turn this off here. Whoops. I did not want to do that. So let me, uh, let me put my smiling face back on here and talk to you for a minute about that because I, I have a story that. Uh, 
several years ago and, and we were working on a I think it was a 2003 Ford Crown Victoria and that's not exactly the latest and greatest technology 17 years old but a lot of things were the same then as they are now uh, it, you know fuel injected port fuel injection um, you know no distributor in the ignition so relatively decent ignition system and this car was uh, was exhibiting a, kind of a strange symptom this um, bucking jerking sort of uh it felt like not all the cylinders were firing or not all the cylinders were firing completely so you know one of the first things you want to do when you're trying to diagnose a drivability problem is determine when this uh under what conditions the problem happens so if you have some sort of a mechanical failure let's say you have a burnt valve or a bent valve or uh, a cam lobe that's worn out or a broken valve spring, or you know you've got rings that are shot. You'll have uh, this poor performance all the time. These things don't change under different driving conditions. If you've got um, a problem related to fuel, like not enough fuel pressure, or something like that, you know that problem is going to show up under those times in, you know, during the engine operation where you need a lot of fuel pressure. If you have some sort of a spark problem, you know, that's gonna show up under conditions where it's difficult to create a spark. So one of the things you're doing when you're doing diagnosis, uh, first thing when a customer complains about some sort of symptom is try to find out when that symptom happens. Is it all the time? Is it on acceleration? Is it at idle? Um, is it only when the engine's cold? Is it only when the engine's warm? So we, you know, these things, symptoms don't always happen all the time. So we had this Crown Vic, and it uh, it would only exhibit the symptoms, this bucking, sort of jerking uh, symptom, cruising on the highway going up a slight hill. And, you know, I drove the car kind of a lot trying to narrow it down to exactly when does this happen. So I would go out on, uh, you know, on 219, uh, 65, 70 miles per hour and uh, cruise along, steady cruise. So you're not, you're not heavily into the accelerator. You're just, just enough accelerator or even put the cruise control on just to keep it going that speed. And then uh, that road is pretty hilly. So I'm driving along at a steady speed and the car's running fine. Um, but when it starts to climb a little bit of a hill and try to maintain that speed, it would start to, um, that's when the symptom would start. You know, definitely felt like cylinders, at least one cylinder was misfiring and probably multiple cylinders were misfiring. So kind of make a long story short, <clears throat> what was happening, uh, watching scan tool data and all that is when it gets up to cruise and it's cruising along for a little while, the uh, computer really leans out the air fuel mixture. Why would it do that? Fuel economy. So cruising along, lean air fuel mixture. So that that's, you know, checks one box, right? Lean air fuel mixtures have higher resistance than rich air fuel mixtures. So across the spark plug gap, now you're making it more difficult for the spark to jump. So it hits this little incline and uh, just that extra little bit of load, right? Brings the cylinder pressure up just enough. That's when the thing started to, uh, to really misfire. So, um, what fixed it, what wound up fixing it was a new set of spark plug wires. So the wires had, you know, reached that point where they were okay when the vehicle was idling, they were okay even under heavy acceleration where it's rich, but lean air fuel mixture, a little bit of a load, put the two together, and that's when they failed. So the new wires fixed it, and, uh, you know, it's just something to keep in mind when you're trying to diagnose something like what's going on there and under what conditions does it happen. I don't remember how I decided to put wires on it, 
Um, I think we checked the spark plugs, may, may have even changed the spark plugs. This is going back several years, so I don't remember. Anyhow, it definitely felt like an ignition misfire. Um, and an ignition misfire, it's kind of, uh, the characteristic is that it, you know, it's affected a lot by engine load. Um, so that's about all I want to talk about now. That's the end of this uh, module one, the slides for that. So when you're done watching this video, uh, by the time you watch this video, there should be uh, a test slash quiz available on Blackboard. If uh, if it's Sunday night and you're watching this, then that test won't be available yet. It's going to come up on uh, Monday morning at 8 o'clock, and it'll be there all week. Uh, don't wait because you want to you want to take an opportunity to try it, and then you can go back and look through the slides and stuff, or even rewatch some of these videos. You can go back and uh, take the test again, and hopefully, you know, everyone should ace it under those conditions. So I'll see you in lab this week. Uh, everything's kind of back to normal, um, so I should be there. And uh, I don't know that I necessarily have any demos to do, so hopefully you guys are bringing in some work. We'll see you then.